So I'm talking about African-American burial societies, which go by a lot of different names, which also makes researching them a little bit difficult. Um, I found them under friendly societies, benevolent associations, mutual beneficial or beneficial or mutual aid societies, burial or union associations, all these different names. But among African Americans, these organizations played a critical role in assisting free people of color both before and after the Civil War. And I'm focusing specifically on those associations which actually owned their own cemeteries because there are certainly many more um, that that participated in burials but didn't actually own the cemetery itself. So these organizations essentially functioned like insurance companies. You would pay an initiation fee or a membership fee and then monthly or weekly dues depending on the organization. And the benefits usually included such things as providing financial assistance when illness kept a member from working, offering burial assistance, providing stipends for widows, paying for the education of children, and finding work for survivors, along with other types of support. But the research I've done attests to the fact that burial expenses and a fitting funeral were the primary reasons that people were members of these organizations. An article published in The Colored American, um, a journal out of Philadelphia in 1837, reinforces the importance of mutual aid societies, stating that, quote, not a colored person of any respectability, however poor, is buried at the expense of the city's poor funds. And that meaning basically that African Americans were much too proud, self-reliant, both as individuals and as a community, to rely on uh, public charity. So we certainly know of lots of um, the, the big fraternal organizations, both black and white, um, that had some role in burials, the Masons, the Elks, uh, Odd Fellows, um, Woodmen of the World, and these provided members often with funeral services, a burial lot, sometimes a headstone, depending on the organization. But these smaller community-oriented organizations were actually much, much more common. They were formed as men's groups, women's groups, or co-ed organizations, and they were available to people of all economic levels. The earliest to found was in Newport, Rhode Island in 1780. It followed shortly after by the Free African Society in Philadelphia in 1787. In Charleston, the Brown Fellowship was founded in 1790, and this is the first organization that I was able to find that actually owned its own cemetery. Here in Maryland, we know that by the 1830s, there were about 40 mutual aid societies recorded in Baltimore alone. Because of black codes, it should be noted that the assembly of African Americans was prohibited except for church services. So many of these organizations have an association with a particular church because it allowed them to hold their meetings um, before or after the church service, where they could discuss matters, collect dues, um, and plan for any upcoming events. After emancipation, the number of burial associations exploded. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of societies with burial benefits created in both urban and rural locations as African Americans banded together to help each other transition from slavery to freedom. And these are the lists I could find for a couple of the states. I found others for Louisiana, Texas, um, the Carolinas. I could not find anything like it for Maryland, unfortunately. In DC, we know that in 1862, there were some 30 burial societies. And of these, six owned or would come to operate their own graveyards. And only two of these cemeteries exist in DC today. The first one um, to form in Washington was the Columbian Harmony Society created in 1825 by six free black men to, quote, aid each other in infirmity, sickness, disease, or accident, and to provide burial for them after death. $100 was collected from each member, and the organization purchased a lot from the city for their burial ground. Columbian Harmony Cemetery opened for burials in 1829. Keep in mind, D.C. was only a city. The L'Enfant Plan was in 1792. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty early for D.C. Uh, the original Columbian Harmony Cemetery was used for only 30 years. In 1858, the cemetery needed to expand, so the society purchased a new lot for $4,000 and relocated the burials here at their own expense. And this is a map of the newer lot. After emancipation, the society opened the cemetery to burials of all African, all non-members, uh, as well as the Columbian Harmony members, 
and it became the city's most active black burial ground between 1880 and 1920. The demand was such that the grounds were expanded twice, reaching a total of 29 acres by 1886. However, the graveyard's popularity ultimately brought about its demise as space for burials ran out. With no perpetual care funds, the cemetery fell into disuse and began to suffer a lack of maintenance by the mid-20th century. In 1958, a developer purchased the valuable property and had the remains, totaling about 37,000 burials, moved to a parcel he owned in Largo, Maryland, and that was the beginning of the today's National Harmony Memorial Park. But as these photos attest, and these were taken in about 1961, shortly before the burials were moved, the cemetery was not in a dire state at the time of its purchase. However, the land was a valuable investment for the new owner who developed a shopping center on the site. And you can see um, it was the, Heck the Heckinger Plaza, if anybody knows that in DC, at the intersection of Rhode Island and Brentwood Roads. Um, he later sold a, a part of the parcel off um, where that Blue M is um, to create the Rhode Island Metro station. Recent development in the area on parts of the Heckinger Plaza has been redeveloped into housing and multi use. And during the development of, of those parcels, uh, burials were located intact, fully intact, um, with the stones buried on top of the grave um, that had to be disinterred and moved to a different, moved uh, off site by the developer. So we suspect there are going to be more as the development continues. There's a plaque erected at the entrance to the station that reads, quote, many distinguished black citizens, including Civil War veterans, were buried in the cemetery. These bodies now rest in the new National Harmony Memorial Park Cemetery in Maryland. In my opinion, this plaque is maybe this big. It's not very large. Um, and I think this is absolutely a travesty. Um, it says nothing about um, the industriousness um, or the, um, you know, the economic viability of African Americans in the 1820s and the community service demonstrated by the society and its cemeteries. In 1838, the Free Young Men's Benevolent Association formed, purchasing land for a cemetery around 1847. Like Columbian Harmony, the society was established to assist its members with the costs of burial and other emergency needs. After the Civil War, they changed their name to the Colored Union Benevolent Association, and the fees were set at $100 for initiation and $0.35 cents per month. Sick members were awarded $3 a week for missed wages, and members could even apply for loans, payable in six months at 6% interest. When a member died, his association brethren would appear at his home wearing a black crepe armband on their left arm to participate in the funeral. In fact, funeral attendance at most of these organizations was mandatory, and if you didn't show up for one reason or another, you had to pay a fine. In 1870, the association bought land for a new burial ground when they ran out of room at their initial one. Uh, the site selected was, it's in Adams Morgan. Um, if you know, Connecticut Avenue was kind of just off the map to the left in Calvert Street, um, just south of the zoo. The, they paid $2,500 in two in installments, and after moving the burials from the old ground to the new, they sold their former cemetery for $15,000. Sort of an aside, because I find it an interesting story. 20 years after they were founded, the association was approached by the Smithsonian Institution, which was in the, stage, the initial stages of planning for the zoo. The Smithsonian records indicate their desire to acquire the cemetery, stating that, quote, this hillside would make a good field for a herd of buffaloes when properly improved. The association refused to sell their land, but they were outplayed when the assistant secretary of the Smithsonian, who had just purchased a home in the upscale neighborhood near the zoo site, got 70 of his new neighbors to petition the city's health department to close the cemetery down. One month later, citing sanitary concerns, the cemetery was shut despite its respectable appearance and active use. At the time it ceased operation, newspaper articles attest that the grounds were enclosed by a whitewashed board fence with mostly painted wooden headboards and a few marble gravestones clearly visible, as well as the large brick holding vault. Despite the closure, the land was not actually turned over to the zoo. In fact, it wasn't until 1940 that the property was sold. 
of the nearly 8,000 burials that we know of at this site, it's believed that only about a few hundred were moved, and that was at the expense and the initiative of families. When construction of a new apartment building commenced in the 1950s, human remains turned up repeatedly until the developer finally gave up the project and gave the land to the District of Columbia. The cemetery is now part of Walter Pierce Park, and the land remains an active subject for archaeological and historical research. Another DC group to own its cemetery was the Union Beneficial Society of the City of Washington, which was founded in 1841. They purchased land for a burial ground in 1845 in southeast Washington, adjacent to the graveyard for the Methodist colored Ebenezer Church, with which they were likely affiliated. You can see they're way down in the southeast um, Capitol Hill neighborhood. The deed made the parcel available to the trustees, quote, to have and to hold for the sole use and benefit of the Union Beneficial Society of the City of Washington for a burial ground and for no other purpose whatever. Not surprisingly, this was not the case. The grounds filled quickly with both members whose expenses were covered as well as non-members who could afford the cost of a lot. Um, information, we don't have any information on the early years of the cemetery's operation, but we do know in its last two years, um, they, I'm sorry, its last five years, they buried about 2,000 individuals. The grounds were so packed by 1883 that burials were being placed on top of one another and the Board of Health prohibited further burials. In 1889, after only 45 years of existence, the remains were taken to the city's crematorium and the lot was developed. The Female Union Band Society was founded in 1842 as the Benevolent Society of Free Black Women who assisted each other in sickness and in death. And this is one of the two cemeteries that remains in the district today. As with a number of benevolent societies, their formation was associated with a church, in this case, Mount Zion Methodist in Georgetown. The society purchased a one and a half acres from the existing church cemetery for their burial site for their all female members. The Female Union Band Society's constitution provided each member $2 per week if she was ill and a burial plot plus $20 for funeral expenses upon death. The constitution also indicates that non-members could purchase lots in the cemetery for $10 or $12 depending on location, plus a fee for opening the grave. The last burial took place here in 1950, and three years later the city's health department prohibited further interments. The cemetery's fate was much debated over the ensuing half century with attempts to sell it, lawsuits and counter lawsuits, sporadic maintenance and long periods of neglect. There was a push in 1976 by the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation working with students from Howard University to document the cemetery and save it from neglect. However, in 2012, the cemetery was listed as one of the most endangered places on the DC Preservation League's list. Today, as you can see, the gravestones are suffering from disrepair. Many of them have been picked up and moved um, as part of that 1976 effort. They were going to clear the land and then put them back, but they actually only moved the stones, cleared the land, and left them in piles off to the side. Um, and there is a partial map that does document where the stones belong to match up with the individual bury there. So today, Fortunately, a, an organization, the Mount Zion Female Union Band Society Historic Memorial Park, Inc., which includes descendants of those buried here, has been created, and they have uh, worked with my office um, under a grant project and have come up with a preservation plan for the cemetery. It's well maintained at this point, although the stones still deserve a lot of attention, and they are working to solicit further funding for restorative work. The Union Burial Society of Georgetown formed after the Civil War in 1868 and had their cemetery just north of Georgetown, where a sizable community of newly freed African Americans had congregated around Battery Kemble, seeking protection during the Civil War. The land was formally deeded to the society in 1875 and is still maintained by descendants of the members. It is surrounded by housing currently, but is in very good shape and is, and is uh, regularly tended to. Now we're gonna to start to move towards Maryland, I promise. Um, so far, all of the organizations that I've discussed were small, local, and independent organizations. 
but many of those in Montgomery County were branches of larger ones. The ancient united order of the sons and daughters, brothers and sisters of Moses is one of these. It was created in 1867 in Morristown, Pennsylvania, with a DC branch established soon after. This was known as White's Tabernacle Number no. 39, which was initially located in the Tenleytown area of DC. The burial ground was established by 1881 and had at least 150 burials when it was sold in 1910 to the Chevy Chase Land Company. And this map is from 1894, but you can see the Chevy Chase Land Company was very actively um, amassing land at this time all around the cemetery to um, develop the Chevy Chase um, suburban neighborhood. In 1911, White's Tabernacle Number no. 39 purchased and began using land along River Road in Bethesda for a new cemetery, but didn't actually receive permission to move its burials from DC until 1921. It's unclear how many of these burials were relocated to Maryland, and similarly, it's unclear how many were removed from the new White's Tabernacle grounds in the 1950s, when part of the cemetery land was taken over by WSSC for stormwater management, and the other part was sold. Some remains may have been moved to Lincoln Park Cemetery or other local grounds, but what we do know is that during con construction of the Westwood Towers, in the picture on the left, there were human rain, remains uncovered and that it was uh, suppressed so that not many people knew about these uh, discoveries. Part of the cemetery and its burials very likely remain under the parking lot and fill at the West Bard site. And this is a site that's been garnering a lot of attention lately um, and also has been the subject of a lot of excellent historic research by Amy Rispin who's here, so if you have questions, she is the person to ask. White's Tabernacle 39 isn't the only one of its kind in Montgomery County, however. Morning Star Tabernacle number 88 of the Grand United Order Brothers and Sisters, Sons and Daughters of Moses, and its cemetery were located in Cabin John, adjacent to the Gibson Grove AME Church. And this is a, just a Google Streetscape view looking towards the church um, south on Seven Locks Road, and that overpass is the Beltway. And just so you get an idea, when you go under the Beltway and look back, that driveway was the drive to go up to the Moses Hall and the cemetery. And I point this out because it's clear that um, the cemetery was not associated with the church. It wasn't a churchyard. It was associated with the Moses Hall, um, quite some distance, so not a huge distance, but obviously separate from the church. According to the children of former members, Morning Star's meetings were held twice a month on Wednesday evenings at which dues were collected. These dues supported the organization's goals of, quote, the maintenance and education of the orphan children of deceased members, the burial of its dead, and the care and oversight of its sick and destitute members. The burials occurred on site from at least 1912 through 1970, although it's quite possible that there are earlier burials on site. Sadly, the Moses Hall burned down in the 1960s, but the graves remain, as well as the history of the community members who are buried there, memorialized on a roadside plaque. And this is the detail of the plaque. And I put this up here just to remind us all that while cemeteries are physically engaging as visitors, um, it's really a, about the people who are buried there as well. The next cemetery to the north is the Mutual Memorial um, Cemetery in Sandy Spring. And you might recognize uh, the, the picture at the bottom right is from a coalition um, tour of the site from the 2008 meeting. So you might see yourself in that picture. And there was a video uh, produced because the Mutual Memorial Cemetery uh, received a grant for $78,000 from the African American Heritage Grant um, through Montgomery, uh, through Maryland Historical Trust. And they produced a video sort of describing their project. Mutual Memorial Cemetery was established in 1873 in Sandy Spring, one of the oldest free black communities in Maryland. The Quakers who founded Sandy Spring freed their slaves by 1800, well before federal or state emancipation. These freed men and women purchased homes, founded houses of worship, created small businesses, and established the cemetery. Originally named Cedar Mount Cemetery for its idyllic setting, it was later renamed in honor of the Mutual Aid Society established at the nearby Sharp Street United Methodist Church. 
The ladies of the Mutual Aid Society were the early caretakers of these hallowed grounds. The lives of those who are interred here spanned important historical events, from the Civil War to the Korean War. Prominent names include Remus Q. Hill, a carpenter born of former slaves, one of the first to purchase land and build a home. Ella Pratt, confidant of Frederick Douglass. Harriet Short, a former slave whose marble headstone was purchased by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Ann Robert Hill, a self-taught builder and philanthropist who built and financed many homes for blacks in Montgomery County at a time when many banks would not provide financing. The Mutual Memorial Cemetery Foundation of Sandy Spring Incorporated is the sponsor of this $78,000 grant to map the cemetery and complete preservation assessment and treatment recommendations for the restoration of grave markers, many of which are handmade. The Grand United Order of Galilean Fishermen was established in Baltimore in 1856. By 1890, there were over 30,000 members all along the East Coast and as far west as Chicago. In 1908, the organization had 20 lodges in Baltimore alone and 12, 12 in the rest of Maryland. Soon to join these ranks was the Eureka Tabernacle 29 in Rockville, seen here, which was created in 1912. Members received weekly benefits of $4 when injury or illness prevented them from working and up to $100 for funeral expenses. In 1917, the Rockville Lodge was able to purchase two acres of land for a cemetery at the intersection of Frederick Avenue and Horner's Lane. And this cemetery is in really good shape. It's still used, and it is currently being maintained by the Mount Calvary Baptist Church of Lincoln Park, which is nearby. So this one is a lovely one to visit if you find yourself in Rockville. Finally, there's a cemetery associated with the Warren Historic Site, at White's Ferry Road and Martinsburg Road, west of Poolsville. The hall is in really bad shape. It's that building um, between the church and the school building that's dark brown with a very saggy roof. Um, but a, um, an older picture of it is at the bottom right where it's not quite as um, forlorn as it is today. And this building was built in 1914 as the Loving Charity Hall, um, the local lodge of the General Grand and Accepted Order of Brothers and Sisters of Love and Charity. The cemetery associated with the society and the church is located some distance away. Um, the Warren Church is actually where it says Hosanna Worship Center. The other one is incorrect. And then the cemetery is where the red dot is, and it's probably about three miles away, up a very weird dirt road through the mountains with creepy neighbors. Um, So the cemetery has a, both a new and an old section separated by a parcel owned by someone else. So it looks like it's two distinct cemeteries, but they're actually um, both associated with one another. It's not entirely clear if the church or the order actually owned the land, but it is certain that the brothers and sisters of love and charity were heavily involved in the burials that took place here. And I did want to focus on one other organization, not in Montgomery County, um, and maybe it's a good segue to Susan's talk on PG County, um, but I um, happen to have some good images, so I just thought I'd share them with you because it, it shows you the types, of, um, the types of paraphernalia and documentation that these organizations likely had. The Bladensburg Burying Association, also called the Union Burial Association, was formed in 1870, obviously in Bladensburg, Maryland. And there you see the t a, um, a banner that would have been carried at funeral processions, the badges that members wore during funerals, and a membership card for Miss uh, Flossie White. Burial societies, which owned and operated their own cemeteries, leave a historical and geographical trail across the region and demonstrate the importance among African Americans of a secure plan for burial. The pervasiveness and popularity of burial societies is indicative of the determination of African Americans not to be refused equal treatment in death as they may have been in life. As their final statement, and mine, burial society members were laid to rest in a respectable place after ensuring that their families would be cared for, leaving their burial grounds as testament to their industriousness, self-reliance, and the true meaning of community. Thank you. Oh, 
Oh, questions now? Sure, if anybody has any. And I'm sorry I had to read that. I know it's boring to listen to somebody read, but I, I would have flubbed it if I didn't. Uh, yes, uh, Brian. Oh, sorry, I got Kristen first. Um, she, um, she's asking about the um, cemetery on Seven Locks Road, um, the White's Tabernacle, and um, yeah, Gibson Grove. The, and I should clarify, because apparently I was confusing. The cemetery itself and the organization, the, the White's Tabernacle, um, were associated with the church, but the church did not own the land and it didn't um, necessarily provide for um, it didn't pay for the burials. So the, the association took the responsibility of purchasing the land for its burials and for paying for the burials themselves. So I'm, they were affiliated, but there used to be a, a community hall, the Moses Hall, where they actually had their meetings, which is distinct from the church. I mean, they're right next to each other. Obviously, everybody who was a member of the, of the organization probably went to church there, but not necessarily. Yes, Brian. That's, that's a really good question. Um, Brian asked if I had information on um, how these societies acquired their land and if perhaps they were, um, they bought the land where an existing cemetery already was present and just expanded on it. And that happens a lot um, in DC, in, in other areas, and um, I suspect is probably the case in some of these. Um, I d haven't done deed research on, on these, so I can't really say. Um, what I can say is they, that they all did acquire the land of their own, um, at their own expense. Um, they, they had to fundraise to have enough money to purchase the land. But in many cases, they purchased the land from the abutting church that they were affiliated with. Female Union Band Society was that way. Probably Gibson Grove was that way. Um, the other one down in Capitol Hill was that way. So it's quite likely um, that that they did. And the one that was by Battery Kemble, the one up in um, just north of Georgetown, that one I suspect just started for burials because they needed a place when people passed away, and they just started using it. And the society formed in 1868, likely after the first burial and they didn't acquire the land until 1875, and I believe that land was given to them. Yes? non-church-related African-American burial grounds? Right, so it would be like an extended family. Sure, many of those. Um, and many of those had associations that would bury their members there, but I only focused on the ones that owned their own cemeteries. But there are, of course, dozens, hundreds of African-American um, burial grounds um, not affiliated with churches. There are quite a few in DC that I am sure just started out of necessity. Somebody died, it was vacant land. At that time, there wasn't a whole lot around, so you just needed to find a place and you buried them. And it developed into a community burial ground. And this happened for both black and white communities. Um, and usually, I mean, the land, at some point, whoever actually owned the land ceded it to an organization that was found, that was created after the burials had been going on for a while. Um, Sometimes these were, um, I mean, they weren't formally organized. So if your family member died, 
You went out there with a shovel, dug the grave yourself, put the person in, and erected your own headstone. Um, so they were fairly informal without a sexton or, or anything of that nature. Did that help? Yeah, the um, Most of the societies that I talked about are long gone. Um, they don't exist anymore. Um, and I suggest you talk to Glenn about a Trader Foundation grant um, to um, assist. I mean, I know Haiti well, and um, and there are certainly numbers of cemeteries that began as family grounds and then just sort of opened up to the community as well. Um, Oh, you got a grant. Okay, well, if it was two years ago, they're eligible again, right? <laughs> yes, they are. Um, yeah, none of these societies that I've talked about today exist. Um, so I would suggest, you know, African American genealogical societies or um, historical associations um, or a statewide or heritage tourism, something like that. MHT. Could, could, could you charter your own? Sure, I don't see why not. I mean, if you've got your own 501c13 in the works, you'll be able to accept donations, is that correct? Or no? Okay, you have to be a 501c. Yes. yes. So, yeah. Yes, I'm getting yeses from the people who know. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, Susan. I'm just so glad you mentioned Bladesburg. Oh, good. Sure. Yeah, Bladensburg, um, the, the descendants of the founders just within the past, I'd say, four or five years, donated um, all of their records. And I mean, all those little cards of membership, they have hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, they were donated to the Smithsonian African American Museum in Anacostia. And they are currently um, working to um, digitally inventory all of them. So a lot of them are accessible on the web. Um, or will be so and there's a lot of history on the website and it, it is fascinating it's a wonderful family story and um, the founder has a really great history um, starting in slavery and moving forward one more in the back yeah. um, when you were talking about Harmony Cemetery being moved mm -hmm. um, do you know how many actual um, burials were disinterred and moved or whether it was headstones that were moved or alone or if there's still burials Oh, you know, whenever a cemetery says it's been moved, and I'm sure anybody who's done archaeology on cemeteries or can attest, they never get everything. Um, I don't know how many were, oh, I don't know how many were moved from the first Harmony to the second Harmony. From the second Harmony up to Largo, Maryland um, in the 1960s, they, they were recorded 37,000 burials. But we do know that they didn't get them all because they have they have found intact um, intact coffins and um, burials on the site still. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, down in Virginia, I think. And the headstones were, were found. They were being used. They were hauled up by another dump truck and dumped along the river and used as a septic control. So, and last time they were left here, that's where the headstones were found. Yeah, we know that they were, they were found as riprap. Um, yeah. And I'm going to blame Virginia because I think it was down there. Um, and yes, they were. Thank you for pointing that out. When they did these disinterments, it wasn't. Um, thoughtful or careful. Um, so they, and they were all put in one, one location and um, there is a memorial, a group memorial for uh, everybody who has moved, but not individual ones. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you.